everyone. Is the microphone working? Okay, we're good. Hi, you're probably wondering, how did a 13-year-old get a TED Talk? And first of all, I want to say thank you so much for the compliment. I am nearly 30. I'm not sure if it's my mom's genetics or the trauma that keeps me looking so young. <laughs> um, but in all seriousness, my childhood was very challenging. In school, I was the weird kid. I was the kid that others didn't want to play with, the one that said socially inappropriate things, the one that didn't get invited to the birthday parties or asked to go to the football game. But it was also very challenging in the classroom because as the teacher was teaching, I was doodling on the side of my notebook and struggling to sit in my chair for more than 20 minutes at a time. And the teachers would look at me and think that that's a, that's a choice that I made. I could pay attention, I just didn't want to. And that couldn't be further from the truth. I really wanted to be a good kid. I really wanted to pay attention. But it didn't matter how hard I tried, I couldn't. But my childhood was a lot more complex than just having trouble in school. Because at home, I had both parents. I had my dad, who was addicted to drugs and alcohol, and he was very emotionally abusive. But I also had my mom, who was an amazing mom. But she was physically disabled, and she relied on my dad's income to raise me and my brother. So as you can imagine, living with him was really hard. But when I was 16, she found the courage to leave him. And for the first time in my life, there was hope. And it was a hope that knowing that we would be living off of $800 a month couldn't overshadow. It was a new beginning. The emotional abuse will stop. And it was a new beginning. Until I was just three months from graduating high school. I was in New York City at the time with my best friend. I got the call that everybody dreads, but nobody thinks it's going to happen. My mom died. My best friend, the only person who truly believed in me, and the only person who didn't see me as a weirdo, but an extension of herself. By the time that I got home, my brothers had already picked out her casket. I won't forget picking out the flowers. I won't forget looking down on her in her casket, thinking, Mom, I'm going to make you proud. I have no idea how. I have no idea how I'm going to get through life without you, but I'm going to try my best. And so I did try. It was really important to her that I go to college because she didn't have that opportunity. So I did. The second that I graduated high school, I went across the country and I started college because my dad lived just two miles away and I was really scared since I didn't have my mom there to protect me anymore. And this is where you're probably thinking, and this is where everything turned around and the new start that she finally deserved is here. Wrong. For the next 10 years, I struggled. I struggled academically. I struggled to keep a job. I struggled to make friends. At the lowest point in my life, I was going to the grocery store every day, and I was buying a carton of ice cream, not a pint. A carton of ice cream. So it turns out that I have ADHD and I forgot to flip the, sli the slides. So there you go. That's me and my mom. Every day I was going to the, the grocery store and I'm just getting a, car of, a carton of ice cream. I was going home and I was eating it in one sitting. I was so broke that I contacted an acquaintance who danced at a local gentleman's club because she told me that I could make some quick cash on amateur night. I was forgetting to ring up all the groceries at the grocery store because I didn't know how I was going to feed myself. 
But aside from that, I looked at everybody around me who seemed to have it figured out. They were following the advice of others and they were following the strategies and it worked for them. So I couldn't help but think, I must be the problem. I was working harder than everybody around, else, everybody around me, and yet I was anxious, I was depressed, and I felt so alone. But then something happened in my mid-20s. I found out that I have ADHD. And suddenly it made sense. Why didn't those strategies work for me? It's because they were not made for a brain like mine. And when you know that your brain works differently, then you can find strategies for a brain like yours. And that is what I made my mission, to find strategies that work for brains like mine. I did a deep dive into research. I looked for the patterns. I went to occupational therapy school. I even hired a really successful ADHD or herself to mentor me. Now let's talk about what ADHD is. ADHD is a neurodevelopmental disorder and it stands for attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. You'll notice that these two brains do not look the same and therefore they don't act the same. The top of that ADHD brain, now the top of our brains, if we were to put our finger on our uh, forehead, right behind it is the frontal lobe. Us ADHDers have an underdeveloped frontal lobe. The frontal lobe controls executive functioning. What is that? Starting a task, finishing a task, switching tasks, prioritizing, organizing, emotional regulation. Think of the skills that you need to be successful in daily life, to go to a job every day, to even take a shower. It requires executive functioning. No wonder I was struggling. But aside from the challenges with executive functioning, us ADHDers also are incredibly dopamine deprived. Dopamine is that feel-good neurotransmitter. So whereas a neurotypical brain feels pretty good on a day-to-day -day basis as long as something terrible doesn't happen, us ADHDers have a really hard time just feeling okay day-to-day, -day, which is why we seek experiences that will increase dopamine, like new activities and new hobbies. It's the reason that we can find a new hobby on Monday. By Friday, we know everything about it. And by Saturday, we're already chronically bored. But having ADHD does not mean that you are destined for a life of underachievement and sorrow. ADHDers are some of the most innovative problem solvers you will ever find. And that's because every day, we have to overcome the barriers in our mind that don't want to follow through. And if we can overcome the barriers of our mind, there's literally nothing in our personal lives that we can't solve. I tell people all the time, if I'm having a problem in my business, and I have two options, one is to ask an ADHD, -er. the other one is to ask a neurotypical. I'm going to ask an ADHD 100% of the time because by the time the neurotypical has thought of maybe even one possible solution, the ADHD -er has already thought of 127 and guess what? They already tried 30 of them. Us ADHDers also have the strength of impulsive action. And I know what you're thinking. Being impulsive is not a strength. It absolutely can be and it has been in my life. So as I mentioned before, I really struggled in school, which means that it was really hard getting into occupational therapy school. I applied to so many schools, and I was denied from mo most of them, but I was waitlisted at one. So whereas a neurotypical person would say that that's my answer, no, not if you're impulsive with ADHD. I called the admissions office of the occupational therapy department and it looked something like this. Hi, Lisa. Lisa and I were on a first name basis. 
Um, so is there any update to that wait list? No, there's not, Jamie, but you can keep calling. I'm so sorry, Lisa. I, I just really want into the program. I know, and that's okay. You can keep calling. Thank you so much, Lisa. I called no less than 15 times. And two weeks before the program started, I got a spot in the cohort because of my impulsive action. But that's not the only place that impulsive action also served me. I went from an idea to not one but two businesses in less than a year because of impulsive action. I was in an ADHD Facebook group and I asked people, how do you run a business when you have ADHD? I knew nothing. And that is where I found Maggie. Maggie is my ADHD business coach who, not, who helped me to not only build my existing business, but then asked me to be a partner in hers, which is kind of insane because she was a nearly seven-figure business owner at the time, and I had three months of business experience under my belt. And when I told her that I would be sharing that story with you, she said they're going to think I'm absolutely insane. And I said, well, I'm doing a TED Talk. I think you made a great choice. Statistically, I was not supposed to be successful. I was not supposed to be a master of occupational therapy. I was not supposed to be a multi-business owner. And I sure as heck was not supposed to be a TEDx speaker. But to that I say that my brain is beautiful. It is no better and is no worse than yours, but it does operate by a different blueprint. You may say that I am impulsive. I say that I take action quickly. You say that I miss the social cues. I say that I skip the small talk and I connect quickly. You say I shouldn't be successful because I have ADHD. I say that I am successful largely because I have ADHD. So if you have ADHD, this is what I want to share with you. You are not too much. You are not too loud. And you do not take up too much space simply for existing. Do not let the rejection or the statistics overshadow the fact that you are the most creative and capable person in every single room that you have ever entered. And you will find that when you are in a room full of fellow ADHDers, that you were never too much. They were not enough. And that is my message worth spreading. Thank you.